Well, welcome to episode number 69 of 10 Minute Record Reviews, and today I'm going to talk about Larry Young's album from 1966, Unity, widely acclaimed as his best ever effort. And this is one of the Blue Note reissues from recent years. This is, I think, 2014, and, uh, and uh, I just have to give a bit of a shout out to Blue Note for the quality of their reissue series, which is, uh, whether it's the 75th anniversary or uh, the other series, because uh, the sound is excellent, the packaging is, is fantastic. It's a serious upgrade to most other reissues. So in terms of what to expect in this album, this is primarily a modal post-bop. It has, just as Young did at various points in his Blue Note career, uh, there are a few flirtations with uh, free jazz and, you know, the new thing, but this is not a free jazz album. For those who are versed that kind of thing, this is a very accessible album. And more than that, it's just an outstanding piece of work. So on this album, you've got a fascinating collection of musicians. You've got Larry Young, the ever-evolving organist who's the leader, but by no means the overwhelmingly dominant player here. There's a lot of democracy in this album. You've got uh, Elvin Jones on drums, you've got uh, young Woody Shaw on trumpet, and you've got Joe Henderson on tenor. And, uh, and the combination of these players, who again, are all at different stages of their own evolution, is just one of those pieces of alchemy where everything comes together really sweetly. You know, the kind of thing which is difficult to recreate. So let's just be thankful that albums like this come along when they do. So, a little bit about uh, Larry Young and his history. So he's born in 1940, he learns how to play, initially, well, and the organ learns how to play R&B in the 1950s, he begins to play jazz towards the end of the 1950s, and, and begins to make a bit of a name for himself. In fact, he releases his first album as a leader for Prestige at the age of 19, which is, which is uh, quite an achievement. And his initial forays in the early 1960s as a leader were primarily in the soul jazz vein. Uh, so you know, in the same kind of uh, same kind of realm as, as Jimmy Smith and others, and he, he continues this until he signs for Blue Note in 1964, and which is arguably a step up in terms of label, and he starts to move away uh, from the soul jazz lane in, more into kind of modal post bop. Um, as I mentioned before, there's some flirtations with uh, free jazz, although he never really fully takes the plunge. Then towards the end of the 1960s, intriguingly, he's one of the first players to really start to move towards fusion. And he appears on that landmark fusion album, Bitches Brew by Miles Davis. And through that connection, he starts to hang around with John McLaughlin. And he and McLaughlin in turn, along with other people like uh, Rasan Roland Kirk, are also hanging around with Hendrix towards the end of the 60s. And uh, Young and McLaughlin and, and others all end up jamming with Hendrix at the record plant at various points in 1969. Not all of those sessions have survived. The McLaughlin jams you can only hear on bootleg. I don't think Kirk ever actually recorded with Hendrix, uh, but Young's work with Hendrix, a little bit of it anyway, was actually recorded and released uh, subsequently uh, by uh, the Hendrix estate in 1980 on this album, Nine to the Universe. And there's, there's, uh, there is uh, the first track on side two, which is called Young Hendrix, which should relieve any suspense as to, uh, as to which track it is. And that, by the way, is, is another excellent album. I'll talk about that another day. So Young is constantly evolving, constantly exploring throughout his career in jazz. Sadly, he's yet another jazz musician who leads a tragically short life. He dies in 1978 at the age of 37, theoretically of pneumonia. There's some uncertainty about that, apparently. So he leaves behind a really varied and interesting body of work. And of all of his albums, whether as a leader or his contributions as a sideman, uh, this particular album, Unity, in 1966, is generally considered to be his greatest work. I mentioned that the players on here were at various stages in their careers. This is recorded in November 65. At this point, Elvin Jones has been playing in the classic Coltrane Quartet for a number of years, but Coltrane, as most will be aware, in this period, 64, 65, 66, is moving ever onwards and outwards into into spiritual jazz, free jazz, his own version of those things. And one of the things which, I don't know if I necessarily always believe this, but certainly the criticism which was leveled at Coltrane at the time was that he was, amongst the things he was leaving behind were any sense of rhythm or melody or, or swing. Certainly two of Coltrane's quartet, Elvin Jones and McCoy Tyner, 
around this period of time, bow out as part of the quartet, effectively feeling, and, and, and Jones certainly said explicitly, as has Tyner, there was no real role for them left in the direction that uh, Coltrane wanted to go. And so, so Coltrane and Rashid Ali and Pharaoh Sanders and others head over the hill to do the things that they did spectacularly, but very different things. And you get the sense here that Jones is really liberated. He's back playing in a band which really swings and, and that energy, I think, just jumps out of the grooves and through the speakers. As for their parts, Woody Shaw and Joe Henderson were at the time playing with Horace Silver. And so you have this, this collection of players and this whole album, frankly, which is beautifully poised between post-bop and the avant-garde, never really fully one or the other, and, and probably very hard to replicate subsequently, but a truly excellent outing. And as always, wonderfully recorded by Rudy Van Gelder, who somehow magically just knew how jazz should sound. And this is another example of, of one of those records, which just sounds as you think it ought to. So the first track in the album is called Zoltan, and it takes its name from Zoltan Kodaly, and in particular from his Harry Janos suite, uh, which Elvin Jones is basically paying a bit of a homage to by laying down this sort of kind of military march beat at the very beginning. Uh, then you get Shaw and Henderson doing this dual riffing, and Larry Young then comes in. It's a little bit avant-garde, but he never really lets go of the rope, as it were. The first extended solo is Shaw's, and it's technically excellent. Henderson comes in and absolutely maintains that level. His sound you can certainly hear the Coltrane influence, I think like you can for most tenor players of that particular era. He, however, has a tone which, to my ears anyway, is all his own. It's much breathier than Coltrane's. Uh, it's such a talent and, and, and such a contribution to this track. And then Young comes in. Now, I sometimes think that the organ stands a bit apart from other instruments which are common in jazz. First of all, it's not that common in jazz, not, as, not compared to uh, piano, bass, drums, sax, and, and trumpet, and so on. Uh, but when it is employed in a non-soul jazz context, uh, I, it, there's always that risk of this being like an organ track as opposed to fitting in more seamlessly, at least again, to my ears. That's not the case with Young. He's a very understated, very tasteful player. Final track on side one is If, which is a Joe Henderson composition. And after a little bit of dual riffing from Shaw and Henderson, Henderson takes the first solo, very pleasing passage of music. Then you get Woody Shaw coming in. And I have to say, I don't know if the trumpet has ever sounded as good on record as it sounds in this particular track. A wonderful sound. Uh, Young's contribution is, is terrific here as well. And, and just a really thrilling first three tracks on, on side one. Side two begins with the Moon Train, which is a, another Woody Shaw composition. Starts with this sort of fanfare of an intro, uh, and then you have Shaw playing what I think is a double track solo uh, in left and right channels. The clarity and the precision of his playing here is just breathtaking. Young comes in, and, and when he comes in, he really kind of ups the swing factor the way that, that only, you know, I think you can only do with a Hammond organ. And then at the end, you have Elvin Jones' most substantial uh, solo on this whole album, kind of goes all Art Blakey, but he's got that lovely, delicate touch. Then the next song is the other of the two covers, which is Softly as the Morning Sunrise, which is, which is a Hammerstein song, a pre-war uh, musical number. It had been done by Davis and Coltrane, been done by Abby Lincoln, uh, done by Eric Dolphy. Henderson starts off phrasing the melody, the intensity keeps on building. By the time that Shaw comes in, his, his trumpet is like basically screaming over the group. And on top of that, then Young comes into this plateau which Henderson and Shaw have built. Probably the greatest collective moment on the whole album occurs during this track. And while Young is playing, Shaw and Henderson are accompanying him with dual riffing. This is the great collective moment on this whole album, named Unity, and I guess fittingly so. Uh, Jones is completely pinning the whole thing together underneath. And then you have a calmer passage with Shaw returning to the main theme. Um, arguable, I guess, but I don't think there are many versions of this song which are better than the one which is delivered on here. And then the album closes out with Beyond All Limits, which is a Woody Shaw composition. Dual riffing again starts a song. There's a real sense of exuberance about this particular track, I find. Shaw at this time is experimenting with chord changes, just generally speaking, in his playing, and there's a really good example of, of him sort of toying with that sort of thing here. Henderson gives some pretty awesome bursts of rapid fire notes here. Shaw is equal, equal to that. Uh, and then Young comes in with another very technically sophisticated piece of playing. And then when Young comes in, he's, if, 
if anything, he's even more technically ambitious than these guys, but somehow what he does just seems totally effortless. Beautiful way to end the album, which winds up here, and, and you're left, like all great pieces of art, uh, wanting more. So this to me is, if anything is worthy of the, of the term masterpiece, this album is worthy of that term. It's thrilling from start to finish. It is a truly collective effort. Every single member of the quartet makes substantial contributions. It's wonderfully recorded in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey by Rudy Van Gelder. As I've said, this is how jazz is supposed to sound, and I can't give this anything other than five out of five.